Thank you very much, Madam Senator, and also to the committee for allowing me to present uh, Assembly Bill 175, which seeks to modernize the Foster Youth Bill of Rights by adding rights that are inclusive of the youth experience and easily accessible to empower their decision-making process. Foster youth have to overcome um, in, innumerable um, burdens and having a high rate of unemployment and incarceration. Uh, these youth have few people to turn to that can help them understand the resources uh, and their rights they're entitled to um, in the foster care system. And a little bit of history, in 2001, uh, SB 899 was uh, authored by uh, Senator Liu of this House, establishing the Foster Youth Bill of Rights and requiring the social workers to notify foster youth of those rights. In 2016, I authored Assembly Bill um, 1067, um, which was signed by Governor Brown and required the Department of Social Services to convene a work group to make recommendations and update provisions um, to the Foster Youth Bill of Rights. Now, um, through those efforts, AB 175 is before this August body today. Uh, we are moving language that is a result and that has the work group have brought together um, and has been coupled well with the uh, feedback from the work group along with uh, DSS. This includes the rights uh, to groom and hygiene products for foster youth, respecting the child's culture and gender identity, and to access computer technology, um, the internet um, that's consistent with children um, and mat of mature age and develop a level um, that those individuals can understand. Um, with me to provide supporting testimonies um, is a representative from the table of Central United Methodist Church who will self-introduce along with the California Youth Connection who will also self-introduce. <clears throat> Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, my name is Jordan Sosa and serve as the statewide policy coordinator for California Youth Connection, also a former foster youth from Los Angeles County and serve as a CYC member through the Orange County chapter. A few things to note for AB 175. For the last 18 years, California has made many strides and progress for the foster youth in terms of housing, higher education, partially due to the work that many folks in the room has done in this committee. As well as the challenges that foster youth faced 18 years ago were very different those that were faced today. And it's critical that our progress and protections matches accordingly. And I believe this bill will be one stepping stone closer to that. Uh, one thing that I gained through my advocacy with California Youth Connection and understanding the local issues that are happening within the child welfare system was a sense of community and an understanding of my rights as a current and former foster youth. I didn't know that being separated from my siblings or being denied to make phone calls to my siblings, or being charged to use the electronics in the home was a violation of my rights. As an organization, it is our vision to advocate for all foster youth and emphasizing that all youth have equal, could be equal partners in contributing to their policies and the decisions that made in their daily lives. All youth in foster care need to have their needs met. Um, I'm saying this as a straight cis male, it is important to recognize my privilege and to advocate for the LGBTQ youth who are in foster care. We believe that AB 12 will make these directions in California to include the rights that Gibson has listed. And like we said, that our vision is to have the right to have our needs met to support to healthy and vibrant adults. We will hear uh, comments on the opposition why, but one comment and quote that my uh, CYC member made through my work in California uh, with California Youth Connection. She said, if trauma could be passed down throughout generations, so then so can healing. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what will we be passing down to our youth? So we re I respectfully ask for your A vote for this legislation. I have my back to that person, so I apologize. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Duhirsu. I'm a co-pastor of the United Methodist Church in Sacramento, and we call ourselves The Table. Hi. In our church in Sacramento are foster parents and foster children, as well as professionals in the fostering system. And I myself am an adoptive mom. 
My family is part of an open adoption, and we are in um, full loving community with our son's birth mom and his birth siblings. And she herself was um, part of California's fostering system. Some time ago, I served on a continuum of care team in Napa County, which supported foster families who fostered teenagers to find ways to communicate and build trust in really difficult and challenging circumstances. I know that foster children begin by experiencing the trauma of separation from their family for any variety of reasons. And as a United Methodist pastor, I believe all children should be treated with respect and with dignity, regardless of their race, their sexual orientation, their gender identity, or their religion. So in order for the work of our foster care system to be successful, we need an intersectional approach which recognizes that barriers and experiences that children have around race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and religion may create challenges for our professional workers and those who are trying to become or be foster parents. So as a pastor supporting a lot of uh, foster parents, I believe it is the responsibility of a foster parent to provide the absolute best loving and stable environment for their foster child or children, regardless of who the child identifies as or what they would like to be called. I also understand that the work toward full inclusion for foster youth is hard work and it's varied and it's complex. Um, therefore, I am in support of AB 175, which seeks to modernize the fostered youth bill of rights for all of us so that it addresses current cultural competencies. And among those are lifting up the rights of Native American children under our Indian Child Welfare Act to receive grooming and hygiene products, which the whole world should want teenagers to always have regardless regardless of their orientation and gender identity, and to attend a cultural activities consistent with their identity, as well as finally to be referred to by their preferred name and their gender pronoun. And I really appreciate you uh, hearing me today. Thank you. Robert Gibson, do you accept the committee's amendments to this bill? Yes. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure if I... I wasn't... It... Yes. Just give me one moment. Oh, of course. Absolutely, we do accept okay, amendments. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. So we'll go ahead and at this point, we'll take witnesses in support of this bill. Uh, if you can <coughs> please come up, uh, state your name, organization, and your position on this bill. Becca Kramer Mauder, ACLU of California, here in strong support. Thank you. Kathy Hall with the California State PTA in support. Sarah Michael Gaston on behalf of Youth Forward in strong support. Jacob Fraker, National Association of Social Work, California Chapter, in strong support. Kristen Power Alliance for Children's Rights, in strong support. Hello, Wes Donnelly, on behalf of Aspirinet, in support. Danielle Molay, California Alliance of Child and Family Services, in support. Jasmine Harris, California Youth Connection, in support. Kiana Arnberg, California Youth Connection, and former foster youth, in support. Vanessa Fernandez, former foster youth in support. Jesse Aguiar, Journey House, in support. Jen Rexroad, California Alliance of Caregivers, in support. Christina Parker, former foster youth in support. Great, thank you. Do we have any witnesses in, uh, opposed to this bill? Please come up. You have three minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
My name is Greg Burt, uh, Chair Members, thank you for having me. Uh, I work for the California Family Council. And I just wanted to highlight um, some of the concerns with just some of these rights that are being established that I think is worth the discussion. Um, you know, as foster care system is set up to protect kids from being exploited um, and to ensure their safety. So I think the question we need to ask is, do all of these rights actually keep kids safe? So here's some of the ones that um, uh, we have concerns about. Um, uh, the right to the Internet. Um, doesn't seem to have an age on here. I know my 11-year-old son doesn't have unlimited rights to the Internet. Um, so I'm concerned about that. How is that defined? Um, here's another thing I'm concerned about. To make, uh, send, receive confidential phone calls and electronic communications. I'm assuming this means emails, texting, and snail mail, too. Okay, my 11-year-old does not have the right to have confidential phone calls because I'm out to protect him, right? And, and I have two girls as well, and so I'm involved in their lives. I want to make sure adults aren't, a, you know, taking advantage of them. Um, uh, the, the next one, uh, the right at any age to get access to contraception, abortion, sexual assault health care without the knowledge or consent of any adult. Um, I cannot imagine why that would be in the best, difference, best interest of foster care kids. Um, and another one, the right to be free from unreasonable searches of personal belongings. Okay, when I, I used to work for Senator Walters down in Orange County and um, uh, one of the things I was in charge of was uh, sex trafficking. And so I got a tour of uh, the Orangewood group home. And one of the things that uh, they told us down there is this, that just something we just heard in the last hearing, that foster kids are very vulnerable to being trafficked. And they would actually, the traffickers would actually recruit kids into trafficking, and then they would send them back into the home to recruit the other kids. Um, and we, Knowing these new rights, I think this is the traffickers are going to love this um, because they'll be able to communicate with kids and the foster care parents and overseers won't be able to see that anything is happening. Um, another right that's established, foster care parents can't threaten to call police. I'm not love to have that explained to me. Um, and then also the right um, that's being established to be referred to by the preferred name and pronoun, no matter what the age of the child. Um, with our organization, we have a lot of folks um, with a religious background, with very traditional views on gender and sexuality, and a lot of them are involved in foster care. And what's going to happen is by forcing uh, these parents to uh, affirm uh, beliefs that they don't believe in, uh, that's going to push those kids out of the foster care. That, not those kids, but the parents out of the foster care system. So for those reasons, um, we're in opposition. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And certainly appreciate the gentleman for uh, raising uh, the same questions as he did in um, the Assembly of uh, Human Services. Um, let me just simply say what we're doing is, uh, for instance, uh, Assembly Member Todd Gloria had already uh, made um, codified um, uh, law in, in back in 2018 with Assembly Bill 2119 that talked about gender affirming care. A lot of the bills that uh, the gentleman spoke about, we're bringing it together and we're putting it into the Foster Youth Bill of Rights. These are laws, these are already laws that these youth already have, but they're placed in different places. What we're attempting to do is place this into the Foster Youth Bill of Rights, where DSS has already um, acquiesced in terms of working with us in terms of making this bill um, better. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, a parent not having the ability to call the police, certainly a parent has the ability in terms of calling the police, especially if, in fact, someone's life is in, in danger. Um, raise the question in terms of whether or not a child um, name uh, pronoun, right? Well, you should be wanting to, if you're bringing a child in as a foster youth into your home, 
Uh, the goal is to provide a structure. As a, the goal there is to also provide um, loving guidance. Um, if that child wants to be called by their pronoun, then you should do just that. Do we want to further stigmatize um, our children and traumatize? We're talking about the most vulnerable young people who are in the foster care system today. And we want to try to do everything that we can to love them, um, to show them love, um, not persecute them, um, not further disenfranchise them, um, not trying to make them to be something they're not um, they're not already, right? And so this bill seeks to um, allow um, the Foster Youth Bill of Rights to have certain rights. Don't we want kids to have access to hygiene products and, and grooming? Why are, we, why are we even putting this in here? We wouldn't have to put this in here if it was already being done. And it's not being done. That's why we put it into law, to making sure that these foster youth understand their rights under the Foster Youth Bill of Rights. And so, Senators, I respectfully ask that I vote uh, for AB 175. Thank you so much. Do we have any members of the public that uh, are here in opposition to this bill? Uh, do we have any members of the public in support of this bill? Please come up, state your name and organization and your position. Support. The support. Steve Ashman, Executive Director of CASA of Stanislaus County, and I wholeheartedly support this bill. Julie McCormick, Children's Law Center of California, in very strong support of this bill. Do we have any questions or comments from committee members? Uh, Senator Pan. Uh, thank you, Senator Gibson, and I appreciate uh, what you're trying to accomplish with the bill, and uh, also I think many of the uh, additional rights that are uh, here, which I understand this comes came from a stakeholder process, correct? That's correct. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, I think are, are very important. I did just want to clarify. Uh, so one of those, and, and I guess it does touch on a little bit on sort of uh, because this applies to all foster youth, so so they span the age range. Uh, so in general, I would uh, agree that um, uh, that you know probably a, uh, an adolescent or someone uh, would. So one is to choose your own health care provider for, you know, medical, dental, et cetera. And in, in, in principle, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, but at some point in terms of the age range, you know, if you're talking about maybe even a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old, when you're talking about five or six-year-old or three-year-old, I'm just wanting to know how do, you, how, how do you see this operationalized and exactly what is the responsibility of the Department of Social Services to see that how... How is that right enforced for particularly a, young, a, a very young child who perhaps is usually not and you know may not necessarily be at the age in which we'd normally expect them to make those kind of, that kind of decision? I just want to figure out how that works. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah. They, they wouldn't. And the thing is that we'll, yeah. you social workers will also continue to play sure. a role right. in this process to making sure that that foster youth have um, adequate care and sure. access to that adequate care right. um, when it comes down to health kinds of decision makings. Along with the foster parent, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, um, as the uh, as this bill moves forward, and I certainly I think it's very important that it moves forward. Um, uh, I, I think maybe we should look at some of these and think about putting some phrases about you know uh, in relation to their developmental you know capacity, right? I, I just I, I just want to be sure that as we as as we uh, move this, you know, as hopefully this bill becomes law, and uh, though exactly. How, therefore, what is the clearly the responsibility of um, the county, you know, the office, foster care system, the, what the state foster care system, the foster care parents, so that there, um, so that there isn't, uh, just so there's more clarity about who's responsible for what. I think we want to empower our foster youth, but we also recognizing um, the age span in which someone's in foster care all the way up to 21, thanks to Senator Bell, uh, mm -hmm. that we want to be sure that they, you know, that uh, uh, that we're respecting their developmental stage. And so, of course, certainly if foster youth is in their late teens or certainly by the time they're 18 mm -hmm. to 21, they should be, you know, calling shots and making decisions. But we also have very young foster children who we just want to know what does that mean if it's in the foster in this uh, Bill of Rights, and so what does what is responsibility of the foster youth versus the foster parent versus the foster the, the, the social worker who works for the Point county? Point well state. taken. So thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd be happy to move the bill. Thank you. Uh, so we have a motion. Uh, Respectfully ask when I vote. All right. So that motion is 
was made by Senator Pan, and the motion is to do pass a, as amended uh, to Senate Judiciary. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Rotato? Aye. Rotato, aye. Stone? No. Stone, no. Bell? Jackson? Pan? Aye. Pan, aye. Wiener? Aye. Wiener, aye. That's 3 1. So the vote is 3 1.